I don't know if this is a question that commonly occurs to people. Sometimes I hear people say things like, what is God up to, or God is up to something, or something like that. But the question of, what is God trying to accomplish? And I was listening to uh, a news program that was interviewing um, people who are politicians and, and academics, experts in international diplomacy, and in, uh, particularly in Asian culture and politics. And they were talking about the situation um, with North Korea. And I'm listening to all these people in these interviews and in this news program, and one thing became very clear to me as I was listening, and that is all of these different people who are involved in this process, they did not agree on what we were trying to accomplish. They, and, and I thought, how, no wonder we can't accomplish anything, because all the people doing the work, they're all trying to accomplish different things. Because some said the goal is to get nuclear weapons away from from, from North Korea. Others said that's not the goal because then North Korea is still a threat to their neighbors. The goal is North Korea is not a threat to their neighbors and to us. And there were others who said, no, no, no. The goal is we have to free the North Korean people from the oppression of their government. And others said, no, our goal is we want to reunify and have one Korea again on the Korean Peninsula. I thought, well, you'll never get anything done because you're all trying to do different things, and some of them are actually counter to each other. That's what we run into today in our, our passage, which appears to us normally, at least when I read this passage from the Gospel of Mark, that it's not a real serious thing. And that's why I wanted to bring up like one of the most serious things going on in the world because to the people living in the first century, this really was life and death stuff. Literally, uh, life and death and eternal life. And, and I'm going to read it in just a second, but first I want to show one more thing up here, and that is uh, something, I got this right off of a school for a middle school uh, English class, talking about understanding stories. And it is, conflict is a struggle between two opposing forces or characters. Without conflict, a story would be boring. A story can have several conflicts. And the main conflict is central to the plot and usually is resolved uh, by the resolution. So um, what we're going to see in this passage I'm about to read is there are actual several conflicts going on. And we have to try and, and understand what is the central conflict, because the central conflict is, is over what is God trying to accomplish. So this is Mark chapter 2. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went to the house of God during the days of Abiathar, who was high priest, and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people, and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath." It sounds like a pretty petty squabble from our perspective 2,000 years later, um, but it lies at the very heart of everything that Jesus is doing and, and life in first century Israel and what it meant to be a Jew. So we heard when Daniel read from Deuteronomy about uh, observing the Sabbath, uh, there are three times, really, that this is really focused and highlighted. There are other times it's mentioned, but three times it is the focus. And the first is in Genesis, chapter 2. God is just finishing up creation. It says, on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all the work of creation. Okay, 
First lesson of the day, the seventh day. What's the seventh day of the week? Saturday. Sunday is not, nor ever has been, nor ever will be the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. Um, I grew up in a state with, in what they called blue laws, where they said everything had to be closed on the Sabbath, and I never understood why they closed everything on Sunday, because I knew Sunday wasn't the Sabbath, but that's the way it was. Um, as I pointed out to people before, having all the stores closed on Sunday did not help us be any more holy. It contributed nothing to the moral fabric of the state. Um, and, and so we have that, we have the Sabbath. In, in Genesis 2, it's the day God rested. Then we get it in the Ten Commandments, we get it twice. We get it first in, in Exodus chapter 20, when the Ten Commandments are originally given. And then what we heard Danielle read from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and what the whole book of Deuteronomy really is, is a, a series of farewell sermons from Moses before he's going to go leave the people. And in the Deuteronomy one, Moses adds something that's not in. When God, God doesn't, when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he says, you know, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Nobody in your household, not you, not your family, not your servants, not your animals, nobody can do any work on the Sabbath. And then, in Deuteronomy, Moses adds something to it. He says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Nobody can work on the Sabbath. This is the day of rest, not you, not your family, not your servants, not your animals. Nobody can work on the Sabbath because you were slaves in Egypt. And God, by his mighty hand, took you out of the slavery of Egypt and brought you into the freedom that you have now, implying that when you were slaves, you had no rest. Now God is giving you, he's giving you the gift of rest. That's really what Moses is saying. And, and so the purpose of the Sabbath was to rest. The purpose of the Sabbath is to, to um, keep us in tune with the very creation that God has placed us in where rest is necessary. So we don't work ourselves to death like they did as slaves and they were worked to death. So Jesus and his disciples are walking along and these Pharisees are watching them. Uh, I heard a great explanation of trying to help understand the Pharisees. Um, Think of the Pharisees as reporters who watch celebrities and report on every little gaffe they make in life. That's who, the, the, the Pharisees are kind of like the Pavarazzi. You know, they're, they're, Jesus is famous, so finding out every little flaw he has is, is, you know, that's what the reporters do. I thought, that's not exactly the role they play, but that, that's a way to understand it. In, in our culture a little bit. So they see Jesus and the disciples walking along and they, they're picking up some, some grain off of the, 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 the wheat or corn, whatever, the food is growing there. They're picking it off and eating it, you know, because they're hungry. And it was not against the law. If you're walking by someone's feet, you know, now, some of you are farmers, you wouldn't be real happy if someone was driving their car by your field and pulled over and jumped out and grabbed some of your corn and got back in their car and drove away. Uh, perfectly legal, though, at that time. You, you could do that. If you're walking by a field and you're hungry, you just go pick some and eat it. And, and, they're like, and, and the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, didn't you see your disciples broke the law? Here's what Jesus does not do. Jesus does not say, no, they didn't, or... It was just a little. He doesn't make excuses for them. He he doesn't try and deflect or defend them or their actions. The guilt of the disciples is not in question. They have broken the Sabbath law according to all the laws and customs of first century Israel. 
there is not a court in Israel at this time that would have not found them guilty. They would have been found, they, they broke the law. Jesus doesn't try and diminish that one bit. He, he lets the law stand and he lets their customs stand. And he doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus agrees. They did work. But then he draws their attention to this uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 21, where David is on the run. David isn't king yet. Saul is king, but God has said David's going to be king. So Saul is trying to kill David. David and those who support him are on the run. They come to a place this holy uh, shrine where there's some priests there, and they have bread there that's been consecrated, offered to God as a sacrifice. And David comes upon this shrine where these priests are, and he lies to them. He says, I'm on my way to a secret meeting for the king, and my men are hungry. Do you have anything we could eat? They're like, well, we have this consecrated bread, but you know, you can't eat consecrated bread. It would be like if, if I were to, to go over to St. Mary's and, and say over there, you know, I'm really hungry. Could you just go get some of that communion bread off your altar up front and let me eat it? Those of you who grew up Catholic, you know how seriously they would take that. That would not be something. That's about the equivalent here. They're saying, give us your communion bread. We're hungry. And the priest said, well, you can't have this as bread consecrated to God. But, you know, since you're on a mission for the king and the king serves God, okay, here's the bread. So David lies to them and eats this bread that nobody is supposed to eat. And Jesus uses, that's his example saying, it's okay they broke the Sabbath law and ate this because look at what David did when he ate the bread consecrated to the Lord. And they all know the story and they, and they all know David lied. So the source of the conflict then is that Jesus and the Pharisees have a different understanding of what God is trying to accomplish. And so I did a little research this week. Instead of reading in all my books about the Bible what Christians say Jews believe about these items, I wanted to know what do Jews say that Jews believe because I found I have a Uh, Another chaplain in the military uh, that I um, went to school with, and he was a rabbi, and I would have very interesting conversations with him because um, he would tell me things about his perspective of at the time that Jesus lived, and it's like, wow, that's that's really different. That is not not the perspective I grew up with. Um, And so I started doing some research, and I went to like, I didn't want to know just what anybody said, because anybody can say anything. So I went to uh, a couple official Jewish websites on this is what Jews believe, Jewish educational websites for Jews. And and I found what they had to say about this, the law. Because that's what's at question here is, is Jesus' disciples broke the law. And the Pharisees, who are the defenders of the law, got mad about it, and Jesus just kind of blows him off. He says, you got it all wrong. And so, so this is, what I'm going to put up here, is not my opinion, it's not what Christians say Jews believe. This is what Jews, the, the orthodox position on what Jews believe the role of the law is. The purpose of the law is to bless people, both physically and spiritually. By following the physical law, a person can approach a place of human perfection so that they can live in perfection eternally. That that is really at the heart of living a Jewish life, is you follow the law, and it brings you blessings, and you follow the law enough that those blessings will carry on into eternity. Jesus rejects this. And in, and in rejecting this, Jesus is rejecting, really, what might be the single most cherished idea of what it means to be a Jew. Jesus is drawing a line between himself and what he says God is trying to accomplish and what God is up to, 
and what the whole culture that he was born into says. Now, there were, there were uh, those who didn't take these laws as seriously as others, but none of them would have disagreed with what I just had up there, not if, not if they were part of the larger culture. So Jesus rejects that, and, and looking at all the different things Jesus says about the law and God's law through his ministry, um, I've kind of summarized what it is he says, and that is, the law, of God, the law is God's servant, but it is God's servants in matters that have nothing to do with salvation. In other words, following the law in this life is not going to bring you to a place where you can uh, follow the law in perfection for eternity. Jesus said that's just not what it's about. That's not what God is using the law to accomplish here. He's trying to accomplish something completely different than what you think. And that's why every once in a while, it's a good thing to just stop and ask yourself, what is God trying to accomplish? What is God up to? These Pharisees believed that what God was up to was he gave us these set of rules, and by following these rules, we can bring ourselves to a place of perfection and therefore receive not only physical blessings in this life, but it's spiritual blessings in the life to come. And Jesus says, mm, no, that's not really what God is trying to accomplish here. God is accomplishing something, trying to accomplish something completely different than that. So I, so I ask the question, when it comes to the law, what is God trying to accomplish? And... and um, there are really, I think, three things we can say that God is using the law to accomplish. One is, uh, the law keeps unruly and disobedient people in line. That's, that's what theologians call the civil use of the law. It applies to everybody in all places and all times. It just allows us to have a structure and a, and a community. And, and if we didn't have that, we would have anarchy and chaos. So that's what the law just gives us structure that allows us to lead our lives. The second is that the law is a mirror to show us our sin and direct us towards Christ. That's, that's the Apostle Paul really gets on this one. He loves this one, that, that we look into the perfection of the law, and what the law says back to us is that we are not perfect and it can't help us. So if you think of the law as a mirror, when we look in that mirror, the mirror says, you've got problems in your life, and I can't help you. You need to go over there and talk to Jesus, because he's the one that can help you with all these problems in your life. And then finally, for, for specifically for those who are Christians, the law does show us uh, a life that is pleasing to God. But it's not pleasing to God because in some uh, sort of intangible way that you're holy or something like that. It's a life that's pleasing to God because the law shows us how to be a benefit to those around us. This is, this is where um, I, I, I love, I see a, a progression uh, where, where Moses gives the law and says, don't kill. Jesus comes up and says, you know what? Not killing isn't enough. If you hate your neighbor in your heart, you've just killed them. Where then Martin Luther comes along and says, you know what, I'm going to build on what Jesus said. Not killing isn't enough. We have to defend. We have to protect. That's the real purpose of not killing, is to protect. And so the law then shows us what it means to be a benefit to those around us. And when we're a benefit to those around us, that's a God-pleasing life. So the final word in what is God trying to accomplish, specifically what is God trying to accomplish in regards to the law? God's law is wonderful, but it can never have anything to do with salvation in any way, shape, or form. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. If you ever hear somebody say, 
If you're a Christian, you'll do this, or if you're a Christian, you can't do that. Just say to them, no, I don't think you quite understand. I think you have a, an understanding of Christianity that, that probably has been influenced by those Pharisees who were all about the do's and don'ts. Because, as Scripture says, in Christ, everything is accomplished. Every letter of the law is accomplished through Christ. That's what brings us our salvation. Doesn't mean the law is is useless or no good or outdated. It means it has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with the inner workings in our hearts and in our souls of what it means to be a child of God. Let us pray. Lord God, we just pray that you would lead us and guide us. We pray that that we would take our lead from Jesus, that we would fight against our human nature that wants to put rules and regulations in place for everything and, and to draw lines of who's in and who's out. Instead, we would look to Christ and we would know that it is not how well or how poorly we follow the law that defines us. But it is his life and death and resurrection that defines who we are as your people. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.